A big part of my career has been looking at the therapeutic value of the 12 steps because the 12 steps really have harnessed some powerful psychological forces that creates an amazing change in our life. What does that change? Well, the truth is, is that the 12 steps are engineered to help us achieve emotional sobriety, to achieve true independence of spirit, to achieve autonomy, to learn how to take care of ourselves. These are things that we don't know. Emotional sobriety really helps us learn how to have a healthy relationship, how to have union with the preservation of our integrity, how to cooperate with integrity. Most of us get lost in our relationships. Most of us do a lot of things we don't want to do. We don't really know how to show up in a good way. Emotional sobriety is about learning to have healthy relationships. What's the question going to be, Dekna? Uh, what stood out to me tonight? Uh, you got it, baby. You got it. All right. I got two. I don't know why I always have two answers, but um, continually surrender. And mm. this is ongoing. Just the word continually by itself yeah. can be strong enough. Yeah. That this is not a one and done, one sharing over. But then it's not continually doing what? Surrendering, surrendering, surrendering. It's hobbling demands. That's a, I, I'm so glad you highlighted that because it really captures that this is a process that's unfolding isn't it yeah right on man good one what was your second one i like set free to live in love yeah. like by continually surrendering we'll be set free uh to live in love which sounds wonderful and like when i feel that it feels wonderful yeah well look man i i realize that what i've been looking for my whole life is that freedom I can, I can look back when I had my first drink to what hooked me on it. Maybe there was some genetic thing going on too, you know, in terms of waking up those alcoholic genes or something, but feeling that freedom, that emotional freedom, man, I like that. <laughs> that was it. And if one was going to be good, man, more was going to be better. Here I'm off. <laughs> and I that's say, the same for surrendering. If you surrender a little, surrender more. and it gets Well, better. it's the same thing, but the, in a positive way you're talking yeah. about it. And I experienced it as, you know, I sprinted headlong into, you know, as fast as I could in alcoholism. Right. Blackout drinker when I was 12 years old. I mean, my goodness. Yeah. You think that's why I lost my hair? Or do you think that's another? <laughs> that, that was more genetics than the alcoholism. <laughs> 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 Probably true. <laughs> well, thanks, Dak. It's wonderful, man. Good seeing you. Well, we're going to be wrapping up our discussion of the second insight in my book, 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety, and that's been living consciously. Um, last time I talked about this, I talked about contact functions, which is just the different ways that we make contact with ourselves and with our environment. But I want to talk about what happens at that point of contact tonight? Because that's where living consciously really, really pays off. And last time when Roger shared a lot about self-esteem and, and, uh, and living consciously and, and talking about the interface of that, you know, I brought in at the end of that, you know, he gave some very practical tips. I brought at the end of that is that really at the heart of self-esteem is us becoming aware having an awareness of the habits and patterns we have, meaning what are our habitual ways of thinking? Like when I get disappointed, how do I think about that? Do I find myself blaming other people when I'm disappointed, when things don't go my way? Do I find myself blaming myself? Do I turn against myself? Do I turn against others? So what are my habitual ways of thinking about situations that don't go my way? What are my habitual ways of feeling? Do I walk around and feeling like, my God, I've got a guard. I'm, my feelings are going to get hurt. You know, I'm always taking things personally. You know, am I aware that that's a habit of mine, that I find myself taking things personally? And then we start putting these habits together and we start to see, do they form some kind of a pattern in our life? 
Now, an awareness of these things are going to be critical when we start to discuss the next essential insight, which is becoming aware of our emotional dependence and how it has an impact on our life. So what we're doing with this insight is we're kind of generating the necessary awareness that we're going to use to identify where we get hung up, what creates this gridlock in our life. What creates the impasse we have? What is our block to being able to flow with our experience and to be have the freedom that Declan was just talking about a minute ago? Now, when we look at the kind of contact we make with our environment, let's just look at it from the what I talked about in this chapter about, you know, the three different kind of solutions we come up to with our basic anxiety. So one solution is, is that I'm going to meet my environment in a way where I become master, where I am right all the time, where I'm in control all the time, where I am having power over the situation so I can control everything and everyone around me. Now, I'm doing that you know, because of my anxiety, that if I do that, that somehow I'm going to be okay. And that if I do that, then you're going to really like me. You're going to, and, and this person that falls into this category doesn't want to be liked. They want to be admired. They want you to look up to them and say, oh my God, you've got it all together. You're perfect, right? That's what they're striving for. I'm going to be perfect. And I'm going to step on everyone and everything and on my way to perfection. So they are ruthless. Because if they're less than perfect, they hate themselves. They can't stand themselves. So if you're in a relationship with this person and you're less than perfect, you're going to get some of them, their self-hate projected onto you. So that's how this person makes contact with their environment. They move against it. They wrestle satisfaction from it. They tear it right out of the reality and they're trying to control everything and everyone. So that's one way. They, we call that the appeal of mastery. The other one is the appeal of, of love. So they make contact with their environment and say, I will do whatever I can to make you love me. Because if you love me, I'm going to be okay. The other person says, if I'm perfect, if I master everything, I'll be okay. This person says, if you love me, I'll be okay. So in order to be loved, you can't have a lot of needs and desires. You have to be focused on the other person's needs and desires. So when this person makes contact with their environment, they're coming in with a vigilance about what that other person needs. And so they erase their own needs in order to honor and, and to serve the other person. Now, both people are trying to manipulate their environment to do what their environment, what they think they need from their environment to be okay, which is at the end is the same thing, to be loved, to be accepted, to belong, to feel safe. That's what we're looking for. The third approach to this is kind of a throw in the towel approach. I'm not going to pull off any of this, so I'm just not going to care. I'm going to be needless and wantless. We call it the appeal of freedom, but not the emotional freedom we talk about in emotional sobriety. It's a freedom that comes from resigning, from an attitude of resignation. I'm not going to let anything be that important. I'm not going to attach myself to anything. So if nothing's important, nothing can ever bother me. I'm not going to have any conflicts because I really don't want anything. I'm not going to let anybody become that important to me. I'm not going to have any strivings, no ambition. So that person makes contact with their environment and has a minimal investment in it and doesn't expect anything from anyone, but not in a good way, in a way that they've given up. What we do at the point of contact in our life is going to determine our health and our well-being. A brilliant man by the name of Dr. Christopher Lash says, 
we expect way too much from our environment and way too little from ourselves. You see, because all of these solutions that I, I came up with are based on our relationship and looking to our environment to make us okay. And that's fine. When we're children, we are completely dependent. To a large degree, that changes as we grow and we get older. We become more and more differentiated and more and have a greater ability to take care of ourselves and act on our own behalf. But a lot of that also has to do with the kind of experiences we had in childhood, how we're met, the degree that our self-esteem is developed, and all of those other kinds of things. But the essence of self-esteem later on is to no longer try to manipulate our environment to support us, but to transcend that environmental support and learn how to meet our environment to get our needs met rather than to expect our environment to meet our needs. I'll say that again. As we grow along these lines of emotional sobriety, we no longer are expecting our environment to meet our needs. We are taking responsibility to meet our environment in a way to get our needs met. In a relationship, it means that we're no longer taking responsibility for our partner. We're taking responsibility, meaning that we now respond to our partner, but don't take responsibility for them. That's what emotional sobriety looks like in a relationship. So bringing consciousness to an awareness to ourselves and how we function is going to lead us down the path that the goal or towards the goal of emotional sobriety. And there's two goals here that we have is to be able to act for ourselves without impinging on the rights of others, to be able to act for ourselves without being selfish and to be able to act for others without being selfless. So to act for others without being selfish and impinging on the rights of others and to act for others without being selfless, to not lose ourselves in the connection, but to keep ourselves in. Is that if I give something to you, I want to give it to you, not because I'm trying to get you to likely like me, because I want to give that. That's who I want to be in relationship to you. So my joy, my satisfaction comes in the giving not in your reaction to it. So that's how come we're stoking this fan of awareness, of self-awareness. It is with our self-awareness that become a, we become aware of how we're trying to, to manipulate our environment, to try to meet our needs, and then becoming aware of what we need to do to start to act on our own behalf. So with that being said, let me invite my two esteemed colleagues in here with me and they share their perspective on some of the things I'm saying or anything else that they've thought of since our last time. And then we can have a little more time to open this up and have you share what it means to live consciously in your recovery. Okay. Well, okay with you if I kick it off, Tom? Sure. Go ahead, Roger. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks, Al. Um, you had mentioned to me you were going to bring it back to that issue about you know, contact. And in an earlier talk, you talked about the modes with which we make contact through all of our senses and, and so on. So these three styles, I think it can be hard to understand sometimes that all three of these styles, the style of uh, mastery and the style of giving up hope it reminded me of a line from a a humorist um who writes these wonderful aphorisms with little illustrations his name actually is ashley brilliant is his real name right, his little right. cards are called pot shots and one of his pot shots says i feel much better now that i've given up hope <laughs> <laughs> okay i feel much better now that i've given up hope and and we can relate because like you said, Alan, with the idea of how we using disappointment is a great example, how we respond to our own disappointment. And these things, if you're like me, are not easy, are not easy for, for us to see. 
I mentioned two of the three coping styles, the appeal of mastery. I, I didn't mention the second one yet, the appeal of love, and then the resignation reaction, the, the throw in, in the towel reaction. It can be hard to see that these are all motivated by anxiety, by fear of what we're going to experience if we don't have this way of reacting. And it's not just in our words and in our behavior. It's very much in our thoughts and in our attitude, especially the style of mastery. That person, or when I'm in that mode, me, I'm not going to look anxious at all. In fact, I'm going to look the furthest thing in the world from anxious. Right. I'm going to look extremely self-confident. Yep. I'm going to look strong. I'm going to look decisive. I'm going to look like I've got it together. And as you said, Alan, almost always until some miracle happens where they're able to penetrate that role that they've adopted and they begin to see through it, the person's not aware of it at a conscious level themselves, almost always. So you can see how difficult consciousness can be, how wow. difficult it can be to, de to develop the kind of self-awareness. I prefer that term because self-consciousness has a whole other meaning for us where we feel mm -hmm. embarrassed and uncomfortably aware of ourselves and that kind of thing. But this whole issue of self-awareness is such a challenge, and it still is for me every day, and I, I don't expect that to change until I die. It can be very hard to see, including with the person who just resigns and gives up. They might not be experiencing much anxiety at all. Think about that saying I just said. I feel much better now that I've given up hope. It can be a very powerful way to diffuse um, anxiety. The anxiety is most clear in the person who is constantly striving to win the love and approval of other people. Right. And again, from my perspective, we've all been there in certain situations. For some of us, it's like our, our major MO in our lives. But all three of these styles at certain moments, I think, can characterize all of us. Well, I it's think you, made a, just... you make a good point there, Raj. You see, this is like being right-handed or left-handed. One of these is going to be a little more dominant than the other. Yes. But all of them are available to us, right? And look, yeah. the other part of this is, and you really, you know, I, I, I think we could even make this point, is that is what, if they weren't fixed, each of these can be a value. Yeah, there's an element in all of them. To me, the desire to please somebody I love can be fundamentally a really healthy desire. It's an issue of balance. And I'll talk about that on, on Saturday. I was just going over the, the talk I wanted to do at the, at the symposium. All of these elements, like you said, can have a positive intention some of the time, as well as a very manipulative. You said that the focus is on controlling the environment, and that is where the focus is. But underneath that, it's still about what? Who? Me, 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 because I'm not differentiated. And as you talked about so well in, in the first of your you know, 12 essential insights, when we're not differentiated properly, where we don't have a sense of self that we are at least gradually developing, because it's never perfect, you know, we're always learning, we will be very self-centered in our yeah. functioning. That it's, and I said a few weeks ago when you were talking about it, it sounds like a paradox that the more clear my sense of self is, the less self-centered. I'm likely to be in a relationship, but that's exactly how this works. Because when I have a clear sense of who I am and what I'm feeling, I'm pretty accepting toward most, not all, but most of what I'm thinking and feeling and doing. I feel grounded in my own experience. And then I'm not afraid to make a more open kind of contact with you. I'm not afraid if I feel disappointed or hurt. I'm not phobic about that feeling now if it's somebody i i really love deeply 
you know, I'm still going to have some anxiety about it. And I'm certainly going to be disappointed if I don't get the response that I want. So please don't get black and white in our thinking about this. We're going to go through disappointment. It's just if I'm better differentiated, and again, in some situations I am and some I'm not, with some people I am and some I'm not, right? But if I'm better differentiated, I have enough self-support where I can tolerate those feelings without falling apart. Yeah. Or if I fall apart, I can reach out for help from somebody that, who actually might be able to help me, right? Rather than choosing somebody who has nothing to offer, which is another trap that we fall into a lot of the time. You know, we turn toward somebody that our rational mind knows doesn't have much to offer us at an emotional level. And that person is going to be my partner for a lifetime, <laughs> you know, and I'm going to change them and I'm going to get what I want. And we, we, a lot of the time, a lot of us set down that journey. Why? Because we don't have yet the awareness we need to see more clearly and then let what we're seeing, let the experience of that, how that feels to us impact our decision making to help us out. So those are a few thoughts that, that I have, Tom. What what comes up for you about this? Yeah, th thanks, Roger. Um, one is that <clears throat> the idea of the expansive solution, the, the victor, I I don't identify with that at all. But reading Bill Wilson's story you know, like I, I, I see it. it it's, it's a clear, you know, uh, example, of, you know, for me of like, here's somebody who experienced this and tried to overcome by being expansive and being the victor and the big man in the, on Wall Street and all his stories. Um, for me, I, I, I was the, res, you know, the resignation, you know, the solution and, and, you know, or at least I, you know, I pretended Right. I pretended that, you know, I had given up, but you know, there was still that piece that, you know, that um, was trying to seek, you know, some some connection and some some solution and, you know, uh, and, and perhaps, um, you know, try to fill myself in with other people versus the full giving up. And I, and I love that idea that, you know, depending on the relationship and the time and where I was one of these roles would would uh, dominate versus the other um when i got to a point where you know i guess i decided to be more of myself and 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 start to set some boundaries and and set some some definition around it it was really an early sobriety around doing fourth step work and six and seven step work where sort of like oh wait i don't like that value let me toss that out you know i i i didn't like that part of me let me, you know how can i enhance you know and improve some character assets that i have I mean, move towards some autonomy uh, these, these were all i don't think they were conscious you know uh, terribly conscious uh, thoughts or uh, until i much later when i got into the bill wilson's work and and alan's material but that was sort of that happened you know like i you know i decided beyond physical sobriety what was next and and how was i going to want to live live my life and kind of capture you know or recapture my true self and you know it, it's scary because it means giving up that role right it's much easier to give up you know at least you know at least it, uh, i thought it was um and i just you know i, I want to open it up uh, to the to the room, but um, recently, or I'm in the middle of reading one of Don Miguel Ruiz's book, the the Voice of Knowledge, um, and uh, reading through it slowly because I'm reading with like a book club. But um, this uh, really resonated with me because it goes back to both uh, sleepwalking and awakening, but even further back when. Um, Alan, we were doing the steps and you talked about the existential crisis that step one creates, right? And um, in this uh, chapter, uh, he's talking about his experience of waking up. So this book versus the four agreements is, is more of his personal journey. And it's in the chapter of a night in the desert. Um, <laughs> and, and he 
he talks about um this is why it takes such courage to face our own lies to face what we believe the structure of our knowledge makes us feel safe um we have the need to know even if we what we know is not the truth right and then he talks about when we discover we are not what we believe we are the foundation of our entire reality begins to collapse the whole story loses meaning and this is very frightening and he said uh i felt uh that night i felt fear because nothing in my story was important any longer yet i still had to function in the world and i, I love i love that it's like whoa, whoa, whoa. like i'm yeah and that's it it's like i recognize i'm sleepwalking I, and now i want to live consciously and and you know and and align with my my true self but oh i gotta don't want to, i don't have to <laughs> that means giving up all these stories right and 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 the good news is i don't have to do it all at once yeah. whatever courage i can muster at you know along the way with you know help and support and, and knowledge that uh, experience that's you know been uh, shared with me uh, you know allows uh, allows me to peel that back piece by piece but it still means giving up the old the old stories and you know like part of me does like going back to resignation you know you, you know i i'm yeah. currently there's some work stuff going on and i'm like i'd really like to quit <laughs> <laughs> can i go literal back? literal resignation literal yeah. resignation uh, and then and then i get good feedback and you know the thought passes or whatever it might be and it was like wow you know okay you know like i can i could i could do this i could strive towards you know uh showing up right showing up for for life what it gives even though that that voice does come back that says hey it'd be much easier if you just you know disappeared for a while whatever that means but um you know so you know i just got to re remember that uh, i can see those thoughts coming that doesn't mean that th that i need to hang on to them let them drag me away does someone need to believe in god to successfully overcome addiction well the way i like to think about what the program does it connects us to who we really are. And what does that mean? Well, there's this incredible force in you and I, this growth force. It's the force that moved us from crawling to walking. You wanted to take those first steps. And when you fell, and you fell a lot of times, you didn't let your failures stop you. You picked yourself up, you learned from it. And how many times did you fail before you walked? You failed as many times as you needed to. You see that force, I call it a biological imperative, a psychological imperative, a spiritual imperative. It's moving you towards wholeness. It's moving you to be what you can be. Just like in the acorn is all the information it needs to become an oak tree. In you is all the information you need to become you. Become a you that can cope with life and to deal with whatever you need to deal with to be okay. And that's what I'll talk about in my new book, The 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety.